So no transgenic knockout, not talking about cancer, yes. Yes, yes. Why you have to breed the mice again? Because the mice actually have a very small lifespan and when you are working and trying to figure out the function of a particular gene, you you will have you, you take a long time to figure that one out. So you have to have a lot of mice. Yeah. So you expand based on the one that was your phenotype. You know, your genotype, your phenotype. So you just keep a lot of them in stock. Okay. okay so coming to the genetics of cancer. <laughs> We call them mouse um, Rudini, by the way. <laughs> okay, so a small outline of what we're going to talk about for cancer. Cancer is not just cancer. It's a lot of diseases that's just compiled by the name of cancer. So that many, many, as many different types of cells you have in the body, that is potentially as you know how many cancers you can possibly have. So if you have your body is made up of about 200 different types of cells. You can have 200 different types of cancers, at least, out there, because sometimes the same cell can have more than one type of cancers. So it's, a, it's not a very simple thing to talk about. Now, mutation in different numbers, uh, different types of genes can contribute to cancer. Now, the most one important thing to keep in mind about cancer is that not one single mutation is going to cause cancer. You need to have multiple mutations. You need to have multiple insults in a particular gene in order to bring up the, uh, the cancer. Um, now, yeah, of course, changing chromosome number and chromosome structure are often associated uh, with cancer. But just in just a little outline, we know that viruses are also associated with cancers. Um, also, epigenetic changes. Now, remember epigenetics. What is epigenetics? Is something that does not have to do with the DNA, something that influences how the genes are going to be expressed and is not directly linked to the DNA sequence. By epigenetics, like for example, as you, when you have uh, that, the colony of bees, that they are selecting a particular bee to be the queen, they will feed that bee a different type of honey. They feed that bee a, a royal jelly, that's what it's called. Why? because the royal jelly has properties they are going to modify the expression, the gene expression on that particular larva, on that particular bee. What do you call the baby of the bee? Is it a larva? Pope? Something like that? Yeah, it grows, right? So if you feed that little thing, this royal jelly, it will become a queen bee. So those are epigenetic factors. Also, remember with that rabbit, the Himalayan rabbit, that if you keep it in warm temperature, uh, it's going to be all white. And then if you put it in the cold, the strength is going to be black. Epigenetic changes. Another example of epigenetics is the wings on the fly. If the weather is warm, the wings are going to grow. If the weather is cold, then they don't fly, so they just, they just die. So epigenetic changes are also very important for development of cancer. So tumor, we have tumor formation. We have to know that cancer is a genetic disease because it has to do with mutations in the genes. And there are also roles of environmental factors that can, you know, as I said, can influence epigenetics and the development of cancer. Now, we know that depending on, let me see. Okay, these are the most common types of cancers that we see uh, in the United States. So you see on the top of the line here is lung cancer, because you know a lot of people love to smoke. So epigenetic factors are influencing how your lung cells are going to behave. Lung cancer, prostate cancer, now, I don't know of any epigenetic factor that's going to influence that, but it must be in the water. Yes? Yeah. 
No, it is epigenetic because if you are in a room full of smoke, the smoke is still getting into your lungs. You are a secondhand smoker. So yeah, we grew up, I mean, I don't know how we survived, I tell you. you know, because the time we grew up, I remember when my younger brother was born, they had this little pen, like a big pen, they call it, what it is. And my mother smoked for like 25 years of her life. She has a lots of heart disease, no cancer. You know? But uh, we remember her smoking right close to that play pen. And all the smoke around, it could draw in the air. And we were breathing all that. At one point, she was working in the lab, and we thought it was just fascinated to play with those uh, with the mercury, you know, liquid mercury. I mean, have you ever played with it? It's a cool thing. <laughs> it's this metal that you know, if you splash it, and then you go like with a magnet and you collect everything, and it just bubbles up into a long piece of metal. Exactly. <laughs> don't please don't ever play with mercury. But I'm just saying, you know, I don't know how we managed to survive our childhoods. Because, because first the second hand smoke, and second all this mercury. I mean, we used to fight for the mercury, for goodness sake. You know? Oh, she used to work in a lab. Whenever they have broken thermometers, you know, mercury used to come home all the time. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, well, <laughs> no, yeah. yeah, besides, if it's going to get kidnapped. <laughs> yes, so, you know, yes, and then the thing, the idea here is that, yes, these are factors that can influence the development of cancer, the development, you know, yeah, we probably breathe, you know, a lot of mercury and up in our brains, but maybe there was a slight chance that the thing was not going to get us to be retarded. And maybe we were lucky enough to be on that small percentage that was out of the whole equation. But then maybe not. I mean, we don't know, really. <laughs> you know? But uh, the thing is that yeah, epigenetic factors and the environment are going to influence what type of cancer you can develop. And a lot of times, you know, we see in the United States, as the population gets older, you will see cancer is a disease of old age. because. Always remember 10,000 mutations in your body every day. So as you get older, your system that repairs the mutation are going to, you know, not be as effective, or you're going to accumulate mutations over the years. Eventually, you know, some cancer cell is going to show up. Now there are several types of cancers. We have benign tumors, if you can call a cancer benign. The benign tumor is a tumor or a growth that stays localized. It does not travel to another other part of the body. For example, if you have a localized melanoma, uh, if, let's say uh, if you're an older person, like 50 year older, and you have a localized melanoma like right on the leg, chances are that if you cut it out, I mean, not the whole leg, just the melanoma, you are going to be fine. Okay, yeah, that actually happened to my mother. You know, Brazil, sun tanning every weekend, you know? After a while, I actually did have a huge melanoma growing there. Leg is hurting every single night. You know, oh, just get me the massage, get the vapor rolling. But nothing is happening, you know? Then nobody ever figured out it could be cancer. So one time, my uncle, who is an oncologist, was around for some birthday party and he saw my mother's leg. He said, No, let me take a look at this. He's like, Oh, tomorrow, you gotta take it out. So he just took a whole chunk out of her leg. And yeah, one leg is not very symmetric with the other one, but the cancer was gone. He just took everything out, he turned up really good, and, uh, and you know, never showed up again. So when it's a benign tumor and it's localized, even if you can get access to it and take it out, you should be fine if it's caught you know, in the early stages. Now, you also have the type, they are malignant tumors. Those tumors will invade other tissues. They're not quite in only one place. Those are the bad ones. And metastasis goes with the malignant tumor and the idea that metastasis yeah, happens with cells of a particular tumor that decide to migrate out of this tumor and just go to somewhere else in the body. Okay. Well, I think you can do all sorts of studies with it. You can do all sorts of studies with it. But if you get if you have a benign tumor at first, you mean? You have a benign tumor, you go the next day and it's coming out. 
is there a possibility that by cutting it for some of the ways of causing it to metastasize? There is always a possibility of things going wrong. Because sometimes when you have a, what you think is a localized tumor and you try to take it out, sometimes you don't get everything out. A cell or two stay back there. You know, and then if that cell will grow, you know, as you see now, cancer does not have a stop for the cell growth, for multiplication, for cell division. So the cancer can come back, yes. Uh, I'm not sure about the treatments. But I know, no, in my mother's case, she never went to any radiation, any chemotherapy, nothing. It was very localized. Cut a piece out, she was fine. Now, well, there is genetic evidence for cancer. <coughs> we know there are certain substances that are carcinogens. And uh, also we know that some chromosomal abnormalities will cause cancer. There is also an inheritance factor for cancer, as we're going to get to that now. Um, and there, uh, we're going to focus also on this retinoblastoma cancer. This is a cancer in the retina. This is a growth in the retina in the eye. Okay, before I forget, let me just have all the tests back. Just hand it over. because it's a well-studied type of cancer and it really shows the point. Now, we also have to think about what is this clonal evolution of tumors, which if we go through the slides, we're going to get there. So as I mentioned here, cancer is a group of diseases that has the ability to affect in near, in near every tissue in the body. Most of the cancers are of epithelial tissues. Okay, like lung and uh, uterus, or skin cancer, or the organs. Most of the cancers are uh, epithelial in nature. And yes, cancer is a genetic disease. And there are also agents, as we have seen, that induce DNA mutations, and those can uh, cause cancer. So uh, carcinogens uh, go hand in hand you know, with the, with the uh, development of cancer. So some cancers are associated with a specific type of gene problem. For example, chronic myeloma leukemia is associated with a shift in a, in a piece of the chromosome from chromosome 22 to chromosome 9. This has a specific name. It's called the Philadelphia shift. When you detect with the fish in situ hybridization this type of shift, you know that the person has uh, chronic myeloma leukemia. So 90% of these cases have to do with that type of chromosomal translocation. Okay, so now you get back in your mind chromosomal translocation. So you imagine the chromosome here getting a piece to the other one. Now this <coughs> chromosome donates a piece to the other one. So what type of translocation is this? Right. This piece gives a part, this chromosome gives a part to the other one and doesn't have anything back. Non-reciprocal translocation. <coughs> yes. So as I mentioned, some forms of cancers run in families. Now, it's not that you inherit the cancer, but you inherit the predisposition to the cancer. Susceptibility, yes. So as I mentioned, there is not only one particular change, except if it is a change like that of chromosomal translocation that is known to cause a particular type of cancer, usually not one small change is going to cause a cancer, like a point mutation, usually does not cause a cancer. You need to have accumulations of mutations over time in order to develop uh, some type of cancer. Now, in the case here that we have for the original blastoma, and let's say you need two mutations in order to develop retinoblastoma, and those are random mutations. 
So let's say in the first mutation, if it hits that particular chromosome, uh, you don't get retinobotsoma because you have the other allele here that is working perfectly fine. So you have one of the alleles expressing the protein that you need in order not to get the cancer, so you're fine. But then if you have a second mutation, a second somatic mutation in the DNA, and you get the other allele knocked out, now here you're gonna have a cell that is developing into a immortal cell because it will hit a gene that is important for control of cell division. Now, both of the alleles are not going to express a protein that is critical. So after these two mutations, then you're going to get the development of the cancer. Now, when you look, for example, at a family who has predisposition to retinoblastoma, you will see that they already come with one of the mutations. The gametes of this family usually has, uh, have one allele that already is carrying the mutation. So in this case, you don't need two events in order to develop the cancer. You only need one mutation to knock out that other healthy allele, and then you develop the cancer. So this is a genetic base for predisposition to or susceptibility to developing that particular type of cancer. As I mentioned, most cancers involve mutation in somatic cells, that means most of the time, you don't really inherit any type of cancer. You can inherit the, the susceptibility uh, in the genes, but mainly it involves somatic cells rather than the gametes. And remember, the somatic cells cannot be passed down to future generations. Is that idea that if you cut the mouse, the tail of the mouse, the mouse is born with a tail <laughs> from that parent? Now, will we be ever able to prevent cancer? The answer is no, because mutations happen every day. You always get some form of mutation in the body. Eventually, there's going to be some mutation that's going to be bad, and then you're going to develop some cancer. So as I mentioned also, yes? So if that's the case, why are we still um, going into the cancer kind of thing? Like, if there is a mutation, why are we still no cure for cancer. Oh, I didn't say there is no cure for cancer. I say there is no way to prevent it. Those are different things. Okay? And also, there is never going to be a cure for cancer because cancer is not only one disease. Cancer is a combination of many, many, many diseases. You have different types of cancers. So, you, you still have to think about how to treat a specific type of cancer at the time. Okay, one type at a time. Like the philosophy of one day at a time, you get through this day and then you think about what's gonna happen next day on the next day. <laughs> <You know? Okay. coughs> so can you ever prevent it? No, you cannot prevent it. Now, as I mentioned, you usually have more than one insult, or one mutation that is going to develop a particular type of cancer. So maybe in the first mutation, you have this cell that is you know, maybe going to develop into cancer. And then if this cell gets another insult, yeah, it's starting to become more cancerous now. And then it gets a third mutation, and okay, now it's a cancer cell. And then you can get even a fourth mutation, and okay, at this stage maybe it is a benign cancer cell. And then it gets another mutation, it becomes a malignant cell, and then you're in trouble. Because the malignant cells will uh, travel in the circulation. Now, <clears throat> there are roles of also where you live that can influence what type of cancer you get. So if you look at people from Canada and Brazil, you see that they develop a lot of lip cancer. If you see people from Hong Kong, they have nasopharynx cancer. Now United States has colon cancer, lung cancer, prostate cancer, bladder cancer. <laughs> uh, you're better off living in another country, but nobody told me that. <laughs> Now, all cancers, the worst place to live for all cancer is in Switzerland. They have a huge incidence of cancer. But I had to add this here. I know, right? But I had to add this little thing here. You know, go look at it when you have the time. Because Switzerland, yeah, Kuwait and Switzerland, and Kuwait I can understand, but in Switzerland, they have, they have the highest number of Nobel Prize winners, winners in the world. So, I mean, maybe all the incidence of cancer is not that bad. <laughs> you 
Okay, so if you want to take a look at, uh, you know, family history of scientific greatness about the Swiss people who keep on getting Nobel Prizes, you know, just uh, for curiosity, it's not going to be on the test. <laughs> Yeah, of course, the owl is in there, you know, it's, yeah, what to say. <laughs> but yeah, but the incidence of cancer is happening there, who knows, you know, what happens in the environment. Yeah, right, yeah, yeah. Yes. And what I hear about also, Swiss, about also the Swiss people is that the fathers are very much involved in the upraising of the kids. And a lot of times the moms are working and you have a lot of stay at home dads. I mean, wouldn't that be great? No? Yes. <laughs> yes, at least a month. At least a month of vacation. By the way, US is the no vacation nation, right? Okay? I don't know why. Uh, I love vacation. Love five. It's very important for the epigenetics of your well being to have a break once in a while. <laughs> Here. Um, what can cause cancers? What well, different types of, of uh, changes are in insults can contribute to the development of cancer? We have what is called the oncogenes and tumor suppressor genes. Uh, we also have genes that control cell division, DNA repair genes, and also remember the telomerase, right? If you cut down from the telomerase end at the chromosomes and you keep on chopping telomerase at every cell division, eventually the cell will die because it's going to hit the important gene. But if you're a cancer cell and the cancer cell is activating the expression of the telomerase protein, so the telomerase, telomeres never get shorter. So they are immortal. Cancer cells are immortal. 90% of all cancer cells have activated telomerase. And then also what promotes the, the spread of cancer in vascularization. So let's go through every one of these steps in, the, in detail here. So you know what, uh, what I'm talking about. So first thing, what is a carcinogen? Anything that can cause cancer is called a carcinogen. Uh, UV light, um, cigarettes, um, you know, something, you know, sunburn, cause cancer. Now, how come we all don't develop cancer as babies? Because we are living in a world that is full of carcinogens and is bombarding ourselves every single day. Well, the answer is that when we are babies and when we are growing up, up to a certain older age, we have very active DNA repair mechanisms. They are constantly monitoring the DNA and fixing it up in case of damage. We also have checkpoints that are important for cell division. And those checkpoints are in place in case the one cell is going to divide. If the checkpoint realizes something is wrong with the cell, it's not going to allow the cell to divide is going to tell the cell to commit suicide. It's going to cause apoptosis. So those are very important for holding down the cancer rates. And also another very, very important factor is our immune system. We do have immune system cells. They're always on the lookout for cancer cells. And you know, I hope I have time that I can show you how that happens and how the cancer cells can fool the immune system and get away with it. Okay. Then as we get older, these functions tend to get more impaired. They remember, if mutations are happening randomly every day, eventually you're going to hit a gene that is doing this type of work. And, and then you get uh, some cancer that's going to proliferate. So cancer accumulates from several mutations of various functional genes. And as I mentioned, for the cell cycle, cell death, DNA repair, telomere maintenance, and the vascularization, very important for the if you don't have vascularization to a certain tumor, then maybe the tumor cannot get out and become malignant. Now, first thing that you have to concentrate here is uh, mutation on genes that can control the cell cycle. So just to go over the cell cycle here, cell cycle again. If you have a cell that just divided, it goes into G1 stage, which is a growth stage. Then, let's see here. <coughs> Once it goes through the synthesis, once it passes, you receive some kind of input from the outside or from the inside, saying to divide, and it starts the synthesis stage of the DNA, DNA replication. Then you are bound to cell division. 
But in order to go to each of these stages, you do have checkpoints that have to make sure that everything is okay with the cell. Um, so once you finish the DNA replication and the cell moves into the GIST stage, then the cell has to go through mitosis. And then at each transaction, you must have this okay signal in order for the cell to progress. So here we have genes that are involved in the cell cycle that are one of two kinds. You have ones that are called proto-oncogenes and another one that are tumor suppressor genes. Now, what are the proto-oncogenes? Those are ones that normally will work for a stimulatory effect on the cell. Now, what that means is that these genes are not activated until the cell wants to divide. Okay, so if these are proto-oncogenes, if you activate those genes, that means the cell will divide, okay? So if you happen to have a mutation on a proto-oncogene, and it happens that this gene is not regulated anymore and is always active, that means your cell is going to divide all the time. So usually when you have a mutation on a proto-oncogene, only one mutation in one <coughs> allele is going to be sufficient to tell the cell to divide. So that would mean, that would mean if, you, if you think about an analogy, if you're driving your car and your proto-oncogene is your gas pedal and you only press it whenever you want to accelerate, but then if you have a mutation on your foot that is your DNA and the foot is only down, there is no way of stopping that car. The car is going to keep on going. That's the function of a proto-oncogene. Now, the other type that you have is a tumor suppressor gene. Now, how this works is that it usually has an inhibitory effect. So one is proto, it means stimulating. The other one is tumor suppressor, which is inhibiting. Now, how this works is that this is, in the analogy to the car, this is the brake in the car. These genes are active, and then when you want, um, uh, I was like confused here. Okay, here, you turn them on when you want them to stop. So if you turn the gene on, you want the cell to stop dividing. So if it happens that your cell is dividing and you turn these tumor suppressors on, you're going to stop the cell division. If you have a mutation in one of the alleles, you, you get a problem because now you are not going to be able to suppress the cell division. The idea here, yeah, I always get a bit confused on how each one works. The idea here, if you just keep on the analogy that proto-oncogenes are the gas pedal and then tumor suppressors are the stop pedal in the car, or the brake pedal. Okay, so uh, when you have uh, a tumor suppressor mutations, you usually need two mutations. Yes, okay, right. You usually need two mutations in a tumor suppressor in order to get the cancer. Why? Think about their function. Proto-oncogene, you need to activate it in order for the cell to do something. Tumor suppressor gene, you need to activate it in order for the cell not to do something, to stop something. So you just have to keep the analogy in your head. If the protein is working and is active and the cell undergoes a particular event like cell division, one mutation is sufficient to cause the cell to divide. When you have a cell that is working to suppress cell division, tumor suppressor, and you have two alleles working to suppress cell division, and you stop one, the other one is still working, so you're still suppressing cell division. You need two events in order to get these tumor suppressors to stop working. You get the point? Yes? Two events but you get this guy to stop working, one event to get these guys to start working. Okay? Oh, that's what I just said. So, when you have a mutation in a proto-oncogene, this guy up here, one mutation, and you get the cell constitutively active. That means you get tumor. Now, when you have the tumor suppressor gene, you usually need two mutations, which means it works as a recessive type of dominance is always a two mutations so at that time you get the phenotype. <coughs>
These are some examples of oncogenes that are known to cause uh, cell division, I mean, to, to be a proto-oncogenes. You probably heard in other classes about the SARC genes and VAS genes, June, POS, PCL1, NIC genes, dark nodules, more specifically, there are just like two genes that are important for concept. Now, so these are some of the tumor suppressor genes that are important in memory tumor suppressors and two mutations in order to get the cancer. So if you have P53 gene that is in the nucleus, this is important for transcription factor and regulation of apoptosis. And if you have this retinoblastoma gene also in the nucleus, is important for transcription activation, the transcription factor. So with two of these here, they are very important and very common, commonly mutated, commonly found as mutated in cancers. That is the P53 and the uh, retinoblastoma gene. I'll show you how they work. <laughs> 